Welcome and good morning to you all. It's a very beautiful morning and so thank you for still coming here. <laughs> um, we gather today as we do each week to remember once again who we truly are, to build community together and to open our hearts and minds to the divine mystery, to the source and the ground of being. You may know that we are now in uh, Lent. And so uh, just share a few words from Unitarian Minister Reverend Ant Howe, who says the season of Lent reminds us that there are journeys we all have to make in life physical journeys, spiritual journeys. Some journeys we can share with others, but other journeys lead us into the wilderness alone. Some people give something up during Lent. Others take something on. Many choose to ignore it. But whatever we think about this season, may we know that ours is a journey of hope our free and liberal faith calls us on a journey from oppression to inclusion, from grief to gladness, from despair to hope. So let's begin our service, um, as is our custom, by lighting our chalice as a symbol of our free religious faith. And uh, those of you joining us online, hello, and uh, you may like to light a candle at home. I've been practicing. <laughs> we light this flame for the love at the core of each one of us. That divine spark that yearns to burn more warmly and shine more brightly still. May we allow it to do just that. The theme of our service today is Lent as a loving practice. And thank you very much to Suzanne for the beautiful display here um, for, for Lent. So let us just begin um, with prayer before we sing. So if you just want to make yourselves comfortable and maybe take a deep breath, settle. And the first prayer I wanted to share with you is um, been written by the writer Sue Monk Kid. Divine Spirit, God of all love. To be fully human, fully myself. To accept all that I am and all that you envision. This is my prayer. Walk with me out to the rim of life beyond security. Take me to the exquisite edge of courage and release me to become. And a short Lenten prayer. God of life, may my choices be guided by your love so that all people may live to their full potential. Amen. So Lent, I think, is uh, uh, associated with a time of simplicity. And so our first hymn 
is number 146 in our green hymn books, True Simplicity. I think this has Quaker roots, this particular hymn. So, tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free. Let's sing hymn number 146. <laughs> Now we're going to have a story and um, Viv has kindly agreed to read it for us today. Um, this is actually a traditional Jewish story, but you'll see how it weaves into the service later. There is this man who loves to read the Sunday newspaper cover to cover. There's just one problem. This man has a five-year-old granddaughter who loves to interrupt him while he tries to do so. The man tries everything to keep her occupied, but to no avail. Finally, one day as he's trying to read, he comes across the travel section and has an idea. There, across the whole front page, is a map of the world. He rips the page off and then he tears it into little pieces. He calls his granddaughter over to him and shows her all these tiny pieces. Honey, here's a game for you. It's called a puzzle. Go and get some sticky tape and then see what you can do to put these pieces back together the way they're supposed to be. She cheerfully agreed and ran off. Just five minutes later, however, she's back with the page all taped together. The man shook his head, amazed, though he wondered if she'd just put the pieces back haphazardly. A careful inspection revealed the map was perfectly reconstructed. He looked at his little girl in disbelief. She must be a genius. How did you figure it out so quickly? He asked. She shrugged and said, it was easy. On the other side of the paper, there was a picture of a person. I know what a person looks like. I just put the person together and the whole world fell into place. Thank you, Viv. I just put the person together and the whole world fell into place. And a reading, a short reading from, um, this comes from a book by Richard Rule, uh, 
a book called Wondrous Encounters, Scripture for Lent. And he writes, there are two moments that matter. One is when you know that your one and only life is absolutely valuable and alive. The other is when you know your life as presently lived is entirely pointless and empty. You need them both to keep you going in the right direction. Lent is about both. The first such moment gives you energy and joy by connecting you with your ultimate source and ground. The second gives you limits and boundaries and a proper humility. So you keep seeking. So you keep seeking the source and ground and not just your small self. Words by Richard Rohr. So now our, um, our second hymn is one we did sing a couple of weeks ago, so I hope you'll know it now. Um, and I warn you in advance, it's only two verses. So make the most of them. It's so simple is the human heart and it's number nine in the green hymn books. Hymn number nine. I love that idea that however dry as a desert field or desert dust life might feel, the heart is always ready for new hope. We're coming into uh, a time of meditation and reflection. Um, so again, I ask you just to make yourselves comfortable in however that feels right for you, but it sometimes helps to have your feet on the floor and maybe just rest your, rest your hands in your lap, perhaps, or on your knees, or have your eyes open or closed as you feel is right. And this is a meditation by the writer Joyce Rupp. Imagine you are sitting by a lake, so clear, you can see to the bottom of it. Look into your heart and find this same transparency.
gaze far inside. What do you see that you appreciate and, and treasure? What do you notice that you would rather not have? <clears throat> Excuse me, sense divine love stirring through this lake of your deep self. Become aware of how your integrity shines as divine love moves the waters of your soul. Welcome the truth of your inherent goodness. and be at peace with the gift of divinity stirring within you. And I invite you now to just take couple of minutes in silence for your own prayer or meditation, simply to sit and be. Marianne Williamson says, love is what we're born with. Fear is what we learn. The spiritual journey is the unlearning of fear and prejudices and the acceptance of love back into our hearts. 
And the Sufi mystic Rumi writes, Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within that you have built against it. And both these quotations seem to me to speak to something at the heart of Lent. But I know that for many of us, Lent is a quiet and subdued and even a solemn festival in the Christian calendar. You probably know, you may know, that it commemorates the 40 days and 40 nights that Jesus spent fasting and praying in the desert immediately after his baptism and was famously tempted by Satan um, and, of course, resisted all temptation. And this was before he began his ministry, so actually not near the time of the crucifixion or the resurrection at all, although in our calendar, of course, Lent leads us to Easter. And I realise that many of us may associate Lent with self-denial. And it may be part of the baggage of a more traditional Christian upbringing for you, perhaps. I looked at Wikipedia and uh, the way you do, and it rather <laughs> it cheerfully tells us that Lent is a time for fasting, mortification of the flesh and repentance of sin. Yikes. Although it does add that it's also a time for prayer, for almsgiving, and for simple living. And I think as Unitarians, we would urge rather more towards that more gentle understanding of what Lent may mean. In fact, the word Lent comes from the Old English word um, Lenkton, which means spring season. So, you know, that gives it a, a different flavour altogether. So you kind of think of it as a sort of spring cleaning for the soul, maybe. But above all, Lent is surely intended as a time to get closer to the sacred, to the divine, to the God of your understanding. And the giving up of things is not meant, as far as I understand it, to be punishment. We're not supposed to martyr ourselves for some sort of holier than thou spiritual brownie points. The intention is rather to gently let go, to let go of those distractions that may lead us away from being our true selves, from that divine spark, that spirit, that God within. And only you can know what these distractions um, temptations, if you want to call them that, are for you in your life, the things that may divert you from what's really better for you. I was uh, talking to Jennifer, uh, uh, if you remember, she was our student minister last year, and she happened to call me, and um, in fact, she's just about to start her ministry in Brighton. She has been given that post, and she starts at the end of March. So she's quite excited and also, as you can imagine, quite apprehensive about that too. But she was telling me, and this is not specifically for Lent, she has given up all media for a month. So no television, no news, no internet for a month. Um, and how liberating she had found it. Um, she had heard about the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, but not much else and hadn't missed the constant onslaught of drama and bad news that we take in day by day. And found she had more time and more headspace as a result. So I found that interesting. And, and I have somewhat more modestly and prosaically given up, um, I was going to say sugar, well, refined sugar, I suppose, for Lent. So biscuits, chocolate, cake, that kind of thing. I say modest, but anyone who knows me will know how much I enjoy those <laughs> things and how much I manage to stuff them uh, into my face. Um, but I also know that both news and sugar can easily become addictive. And if that sounds a bit over the top, um, what I mean is that they can start to take over. They can start to kind of control us. They can start to distract us and get in the way, really. 
of us living freely and well. And from more nourishing ways of being and eating and spending our time. And while letting go of them might initially feel a bit daunting, ultimately, I find anyway, it ends up feeling freeing and self-affirming. Letting go of the things that fill our minds and fill our bodies with short-term hits and highs is not what I would call self-denial. It's surely, it's self-love. It's taking care of ourselves and allowing space to breathe, space to grow, time that nourishes our souls and nurtures our spirits. Clearing away even a little of the clutter of the noise of the ever more competing calls for our attention can be a great way of opening our awareness to those core values that we hold in our hearts, the things that ground us and center us. Of course, if I was really brave, I might let go of more than just sugar. I might practice letting go of judgment. And that definitely would take practice for me. I might try trusting more and fearing less. Or at the very least, I could choose to notice when my fears and judgments rise and be curious about why and when that happens. And I could do that. I will do that. Lent is somewhat solitary in a way. It's not a carnival. There aren't any parties, no fairy lights, presents, feasts. It's quite the opposite of that. It's a spare time, a, a lean time in, in a way, a simple time. It's really just about, if you choose to embrace it, it's about you and your God, however you understand that. It's about deepening your connection in ways that work for you. It's about growing your relationship with the universe, with the divine. And that's a relationship which um, Stephen Crowther, um, who sometimes comes and takes services here, always says at the beginning of his services that this relationship may in fact be the most intimate relationship you have. And I think that's, that can be true. It's that relationship with yourself and with your soul and with the divine spark and the way that you connect with God or the universe. It is intimate. It's unique to you. However, it's a relationship that can very easily get crowded out by the busyness and the pace and the stress and the constant distractions of modern living. So Lent invites us to slow down and to clear space for seeking and connecting with source and ground, as Richard Rohr puts it. But perhaps you feel uncomfortable with this version of Lent too. Maybe it sounds like we're swapping self-denial for self-indulgence. Maybe it sounds like too much navel-gazing and not enough action for your liking. But in that case, I refer you back to our story. The story of the map of the world. When the man's granddaughter said, I just put the person together, the whole world fell into place. And while I fully appreciate that the many problems of the world may not be sorted out quite as simply as that, and that we do also have to act. Our actions surely make more sense and will be so much more rooted and effective when they emerge 
from that still place, the source and the ground of our being, rather than from our smaller, frayed and frantic selves. It's when you sense divine love stirring through the lake of your deep self, as Joyce Rupp puts it, that I think we can start to trust that whatever we do will come from a good place and will be more helpful than harmful. Parker J. Palmer reminds us that self-care, self-love is never a selfish act. It's simply good stewardship, he says, of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer others. Anytime we can listen to our true self and give it the care it requires, we do so not only for ourselves, but for the many others whose lives we touch. Lent has only just begun, just started on Wednesday. So there's still plenty of time, if you choose, six weeks till Easter Sunday. If you wish to choose to make time for yourself, make time for meditation, reflection, prayer, or to give alms, that's A-L-M-S, or to let go of something that really you know is getting in the way. It's just become a habit and really it's not serving you. Or to take up something that might in fact nourish you and bring you closer to the yearnings of your soul. Poppy who took last week's service pointed out that uh, our cousins uh, in America, the Unitarian Universalists, have produced a, a Lent calendar and each day of Lent has a word and the invitation is to reflect on that word and um, maybe take a photograph uh, or even of something that um, resonates with that word in your day. And each word is inspired by our core Unitarian values. So uh, yesterday's word, for example, was spark. And today's is justice. And tomorrow's is relationship. So I don't know if that appeals to any of you, but I, I did post that, um, the graphic of it on our Facebook page. So if you wanted to look it up or ask me if you want me to send it to you, it might just be a prompt. Um, to, to make something. I think, as I've said before, I think all of these festivals, they're not something that we have to follow. They're not something that, you know, we, um, we rigidly, certainly in our Unitarian context, we don't rigidly follow any of these things. But each festival has its own possibilities. It, it offers something. Um, uh, it offers you a chance to go somewhere in yourself or to do something or to try something. Um, so these are only only invitations. You know, no one here is going to say, so what are you doing for Lent then? No. <laughs> well, only out of curiosity, maybe, but not, not in any sort of judgmental way at all. So there are so many ways to, uh, to spend this period of time. You can do it any way you like, but completely ignore it. But hopefully you won't spend it in any sort of miserable self-denial for the sake of it or trying to not to indulge in any sort of misguided uh, self recriminations because goodness knows we don't need those, but rather instead to see it as a chance to, um, to look after yourself, to have compassion for yourself, to give as uh, Parker J. Palmer said, to do good stewardship of the only gift we have, which is ourselves the gift we were put on earth to offer to others. And that gift is ourselves. That gift is you. And may it be so. So our third hymn is um, 
We're sticking with the Green Hymn Book today. This is number 33, and it's Do You Hear? And this, this hymn, I think, speaks to that invitation again to just stop and take notice, to tune in, listen, see, open up to possibilities. So, do you hear, O oh my friend, in the place where you stand, through the sky, through the land, do you hear? Do you hear? Let's sing. going to share with you um, a blessing um, by Jan Richardson. I have shared some blessings of hers before, but um, I like this one because to me it does get to the heart of things and maybe it gets to the heart in a way of a kind of Unitarian approach because I, I'm going to stick my neck out here and say we do not believe in original sin. I think Kathy's laughing in agreement rather than thinking I've gone mad. <laughs> we do um, support the idea of original blessing, that we are originally born, we are born good. We are born good. And that is the, the essence at the heart of us all. We're born innocent and good. And then stuff happens, doesn't it? And um, we have to try and find our way back to that place of original um, peace, really. Find our way home. So I think this blessing speaks to that. It's called Beloved is Where We Begin. If you would enter into the wilderness, do not begin without a blessing. Do not leave without hearing who you are. Beloved, named by the one who has traveled this path before you. Do not go without letting it echo in your ears. And if you find it is hard to let it into your heart, do not despair. That is what this journey is for. I cannot promise this blessing will free you from danger, from fear, from hunger or thirst, from the scorching of sun or the fall of the night. But I can tell you that on this path there will be help. I can tell you that on this way there will be rest. 
I can tell you that you will know the strange graces that come to our aid only on a road such as this, that fly to meet us bearing comfort and strength, that come alongside us for no other cause than to lean themselves toward our ear and with their curious insistence, whisper our name. Beloved, beloved, beloved.